What's going on guys? Coach Matt and you go pro baseball.com. You may recognize this guy, Jeff Fry, Shegon Hitting.com. You've probably seen him on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, your certified hitting guru. Thank yeah, you for self, coming, man. Self-proclaimed, yeah. No, I'm, glad, I'm glad to be here, man. <laughs> um, I just wanted to pick your brain. Obviously, 15-year professional player. Uh, a lot of great knowledge in here. A lot of experience in what you do. Can you tell us, like, your story? Like, how you got into pro ball? Was it an easy journey? And, like, how you developed your swing along the way? Well, I was, uh, went to junior college, Carl Albert Junior College, for two years. And then I went to uh, NAI School, Southeastern Oklahoma State, for two years. And my senior year, I hit 452 and uh, first team All American, uh, set the school record in hitting, which still stands today, believe it or not. Nice. And uh, I thought my career was over. And um, one of my teammates, Benny Calvert, was a stud. We knew he was getting drafted. And uh, he was invited to a Texas Rangers tryout camp. And he decided he didn't want to go. So I said, Well, let me have your invitation. And uh, so my coach, Mike Matheny, called. Um, the Rangers up, Doug Gassaway was a scout and said, hey, Benny's not coming, Fry's coming, uh, but he's not going to stand out at a trial camp. You're going to have to see him play over a prolonged period of time. And so sure enough, I went to Midwest City High School and, you know, typical tryout, you run the 60 and take some ground balls. And I, you know, a lot of guys that I'd played against in college were there and stuff. And, and so now it's time to hit. And so I'm using an aluminum bat first round facing the guy, live BP that I faced in junior college and uh, so my first round man I'm hitting bullets everywhere and you know just uh, hit a home run which I wasn't a, a power hitter and so uh, the scouts take me out of the cage and they say hey next round we want you to use a wooden bat I said okay and I really had never used a wooden bat I used my Willie Mays uh, giveaway bat from the Giants game when I was a kid <laughs> out in the yard but never really practiced not like today right you know so I get in there and they're also making uh, changes to my stance and where I'm holding my hands so it's a little bit awkward when people who have never seen you play are making changes on you. So I, first pitch I get in there and take a strike and, and next pitch I hit a home run over the fence and hit the back fence to the parking lot. Jeez. And, and so now people are really paying attention. And uh, I hit really well off that guy. They call me out of the cage and say, we want you to face one more guy. Um, this six foot 10 pitcher, Mike Converse, who just got released from the Reds. So I'm like, all right, get in there. It's the big old tall dude on the mound. And, Man, I hit another home run off him and a bunch of line drives. and So now they call me out. Now all the other guys from the tryout are coming around, like patting me on the back. And I mean, it was really, I mean, it was like the day of my life. And so now they say, we want you to come to Arlington Stadium for our big tryout, you know? And so a week before the tryout, I go water skiing on Lake Texoma behind Dennis Rodman's boat. <laughs> and um, the rope snapped out of my hand busted two of my fingers up. I had to get stitches through my fingernail and the tip of my finger and I was unable to practice. And I told the doctor in the emergency room, I was like, man, I got a trial in a week. He goes, well, you're not going to be able to go. I said, okay. So he left the room. I went through his drawer. Oh, I'm not proud about this and <laughs> took some gauze pads and rubber gloves, put them in my pocket and said, see you later. Showed up in Arlington Stadium with my hand bandaged up with a rubber glove and then a batting glove. I mean, back in those days, you had one pair of batting gloves for the whole year. You know? <laughs> right, so, right. so I had it on there as tight as I could get it and went and ran the 60 with my batting glove on. No one said anything. <laughs> I took ground balls. It was killing me. Every ground ball was killing me. So now I get in the cage. First swing, the bat flies out of my hand, hits the top of the cage. <laughs> and I pick it up like, you know, no big deal and start swinging. They can tell I'm not swinging like I was two weeks ago. Right, right. So they um, call me out of the cage. They say, what happened? So I take off my glove and, and uh, show them my hand and, and they're saying, well, that happened. I explain and they said, well, obviously you want to play pretty bad. Get your hand ready. Uh, we're going to draft you. Nice. And they draft me in the 30th round and um, signed me for two grand and, uh, <laughs> and I played ticket. for 15 years. Nice. That's awesome. How was it like at the tryout when guys you don't even know are like messing with your swing? Like were you a coachable player back then or was it like annoying or like, how was that for you? No, it was different because I'd never really been coached that much. I mean, back in those days, we just, I mean, coach said, hey, go play. You roll the balls out and we go play, you know, the way we'd learned our whole life. I never had a hitting instructor in my life. Um, and so it was just basically go play ball. And so it was a little bit different, but I mean, these guys, this is where I want to be, you know, in professional baseball. And these guys are telling me what I, they want me to try. So naturally I'm going to try it. And it wasn't like drastic changes. It was right. just a little bit of a change. And 
I mean, the first swing I hit a home run, so I was like, maybe these guys know what they're talking about. <laughs> and how was it from then on? Like, the coaches in pro ball, so a lot of people have this idea that the coaches in pro ball have these secrets and all this stuff to help you and get, get to the major leagues. How was it for you during your journey? Did you come across some coaches that really helped you, or was it like you got to figure it out yourself? How was that? No, I was blessed with uh, two, two coaches that probably had the biggest impact. One was Perry Hill, our, the minor league infield coordinator and the rover, and, and Rudy Jaramillo, who was our um, hitting instructor, our, our you know, roving hitting instructor. And so they didn't really, Perry basically molded me into a major league infielder because I was raw. I mean, I, I threw from way back here, second base, I caught everything underneath me. And I mean, he, I did everything the way he told me to do it, and that made me a big league infielder. And with Rudy, it was, he was more confidence than anything. You know, just being in a, in a good position, comfortable position, and um, he didn't make wholesale changes on you. It was just kind of, he was there, you know, pumping you up, you know, when you hit the ball good or whatever. And, but, you know, I was blessed to have those two guys. That great coaches make a huge difference. And I'm excited that you're now putting information out there mm -hmm. for these guys. How did Shigan, the Shigan movement, like how did that all start up? It was uh, by accident. So there's a couple scouts that I'm friends with that uh, uh, we send each other these funny videos we see on social media. And so I, I don't even know where this video came from, but it was one where this, this kid had this like little plastic deal and he did this move or whatever. So I was in the backyard with my oldest son and I said, hey, I want you to video me real fast. So I did this move with this thing and I was like, oh man, the light bulb went on, right? Because I heard him say that, the light bulb moment or something. And so I posted it on Twitter. And uh, man, I got some serious backlash from people just attacking me, you know? Can't believe you put this my son on there. I didn't put any names or anything. It was right, just right. A, a kid who was already on social media. Right, so right. It's not like I was, you know, picking kids out and putting them on there and right, making right. fun of them. And so once they attacked me, man, I got mad and I was like, man, you got, they don't know me very well. I'm going to have to make some more videos in the next video. <laughs> I think the next video had a hundred thousand views or something like that. Oh, so man. I've just kept going since then. Those first videos you were making were hilarious with this, <laughs> you know, the certified hitting guru and, and, and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And there's crazy stuff out there, there for is. sure. Um, some crazy stuff. What was it like getting back to your swing though? What was it like to develop your swing over time? Like were there, did you have a lot of big changes or were they small changes over time? Maybe you can point out a few specifics or what you were thinking when you're, you're facing a major league pitcher, you know, like yeah. what are you trying to do? Well, um, I basically had the same basic stance until I got to double A. Okay, so my first year I had a rough stretch in short season where I had an over 37 Ooh. in a short season. That's <laughs> tough, right? And I really was not used to using a wooden bat. I broke probably 30 bats in short season. <laughs> and uh, so I really had to learn how to use my hands more instead of an arm swing. Um, and I basically just was kind of spread out like this with my hands here and just stride to the ball, you know, which I hit 286. And then the next year I won the batting title in low A ball nice. and um, hitting that way. I did it pretty well in, in high A hit, I think 272 in the Florida State League, which is a pitcher's league. And then I get to double A and probably two months into the season, I'm hitting about 230. And um, I'm starting to think the writing's on the wall that this is, you know, I've maxed out. And um, we're in a hotel, me and Rick Rona, who played for the Cubs, uh, my roommate, and we're in the hotel atrium area playing uh, wiffle ball. And I'm in there imitating Ruben Sierra. And Ruben Sierra's like this, big leg kick, and Juan Gonzalez and all these guys. And I'm hitting like that um, and just killing the ball. And <laughs> Rona goes, why don't you hit like that in the freaking game? <laughs> I was like, why not? So the next day, went to the field, rainy day so we had no bp and i went right from hitting like this to standing straight up like steve garvey right here my leg was like this leg kick down <laughs> no practice no no bp just wiffle ball one for four but I hit a home run foul and i wasn't even getting close to hitting home runs before wow so i was like man you know i think i like this so from that point of the season i went off and ended up hitting over 300 led our double a team in 10 offensive categories, wow. MVP of the All-Star Game, went to Venezuela, put me on the roster, made the All-Star Team in Venezuela. Next year, three months in AAA, and I was in the big leagues. Wow. With a leg kick like this. And did you keep that kick yep. the rest of your career? Yep. I experimented wow. later in my career. 
Uh, I tried a little uh, no stride a little bit because the problem with the leg kick is if, if you get going forward, you're in trouble. Right. And that's what I was starting to get. I had surgery on my right knee. So you know, when you take a swing like this and your knee pops, it's in your brain. <laughs> right, right, you know, right. It's hard to get it out. So I was not able to keep my weight back like I used to. So I was going forward. So I was like, man, I got to eliminate my stride altogether. So I just kind of started hitting without a stride and just kind of stepping like this. And eventually I got back to my leg kick later and, in my career. And would you say that, like, let's talk about like at the youth level, would you say it's different for every hitter? Like they should experiment or like, how would you, if you were coaching, I don't know if your kids played uh, baseball when they were younger or not, but if you were coaching a young player, what would you tell them in regards to the stride or the swing like in today's game? I, first thing I would do is watch them. I wouldn't do anything or say anything until I watched them. Because some kids don't need coaching. Some kids can just do it. And then some kids need it, you know? It's like, why am I going to make wholesale changes on this kid when I've never even seen him? There's not one way to do this. I'm living proof. You know, I did it multiple ways. And so it just depends. I mean, as long as they're in, you know, the keys to me were being balanced, right? getting your hands back, you know, some type of load, not a big load, but just something getting going and, and, and striding directly toward the pitcher. And I mean, if they can make solid contact, I'm not going to mess with them. But it, it, you know, obviously some kids get this long swing like this and you have to make some changes, but I've never make any changes until I at least watch them hit first. You mentioned confidence being huge for you. How much did competitiveness play a role in your success? Were you a very competitive guy or were oh, you pretty yeah. easy going? Oh yeah, no. No, you wanted to win yeah. at all costs, even if yeah. you're playing ping pong or whatever, or I golf. I want to win or... everything. 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 Still to this day, <laughs> to I want to win everything. Cornhole, you name it. I'm Is cool. It... <laughs> we're, when we're playing something, I'm trying to beat you. No matter, even if it's your kids or oh, whoever. Especially my kids. <laughs> yeah. And I wouldn't let them win games, you know, I'm just, because um, I think you have to build that competitive spirit or competitive nature you know and I just had it my whole life and especially in my career in the big leagues my goal was to outplay the second baseman on the other team I figured if I outplayed their second baseman that would give us a slight advantage right right that's a good way and, to look at and it and during my career some of these guys were studs right. I mean we got Roberto Alomar Chuck Knobloch you know we got Ray Durham I mean some very good baseball players that Still, I felt like if I had a better game that day, I was going to help my team win. And that's, I did quite often. But um, it just always felt like I had to um, do my part for my team. And, um, you know, I wanted to win. When, when 7.05, I was not friends with anybody on that field. And I was going to take you out on double play. I, was, I mean, I was, it was for blood. You know, they're paying me to help my team win. So I'm going to do whatever I can. Talk about that real quick about the approach in hitting like a, were you a, obviously a team player you wanted to outplay the second baseman but were you trying to play was it a different game I guess is what I'm asking back then compared to now were you trying to move guys over and and, and get them in you know was it tell us about your approach yeah it would just just depended what the game situation was I mean and it's funny I helped coach some kids last summer and I asked the guys like what were you thinking right there he goes I wasn't thinking anything I was like how can you come up to the plate not thinking anything? You should have a plan every time you come up to the plate, right? Nobody on, nobody out, whatever. I'm coming in here. First thing I'm doing, I'm looking where the third baseman's at, okay? If he's off the line, I think I can hook one down the line. If he's deep, I might try to drag bunt, okay? I look this way. Um, if the second baseman's shading up the middle, I got that hole over there. You know, I tried to hit the ball certain places. I didn't just go up there trying to hit it hard. You know, I wasn't a power hitter. So I wasn't trying to hit the ball over the fence. Uh, I was trying to direct the ball where I thought I had the best chance of getting a hit. And you know, my specialty was the hit and run. I, was, uh, I hit a lot of ground balls and line drives and didn't strike out. So when I had a runner on base, I was an immediate double play threat, right? So um, I thrived on the hit and run. When that guy was moving, I locked me in and I knew 99.9% .9 of the time I was gonna at least make contact. And so, even to the point in Boston, when Kevin Kennedy was my manager, he had managed me in Texas, and I went up to him and I said, Kevin, what would you think about me putting on my own hit and run? 
And he's like, at first, I don't think he thought it was a good idea because <laughs> if I screw it up, he's going to get blamed. Right, you know? right, right. And so uh, he finally said, all right. I said, I'll just make a sign. I'll have a sign, you know, and, and I'll talk to the base runners, the guys who hit around me in the order. And if I give them a sign, they give it back, they hit and runs on. And I won't put it on in the wrong situation. Right, he trusted right. me to know I would put it on the right situation. And so I probably did it in 1996, 30 times successfully. Wow. Having a sign with Darren Bragg or Darren Lewis, you know, I'd like grab my cup or my belt and he'd take his helmet off. I'd know it was on and I mean, it was on. And, and I would also watch the middle infielders before I came up to the plate. Because a lot of times with a hitter like me that hits the ball the other way, um, the shortstop will cover on a stolen base attempt, thinking I'm going to hit the ball the other way. So I'm going to watch this guy, and if he's cheating closer to second, and the second baseman's moved over, I'm going to try and hook a ball, because I can hit a 12 hopper through the six <laughs> hole, and we got first and third. Right. So I didn't just go up there every time trying to drive it you know, through the four hole. Right. I was thinking, I was watching all the time. And so I just, you know, as long, I figured if, if, I, if he went and I hit a ground ball, the worst thing that could happen is we have a runner on second base in the scoring position. So, I mean, I love the hit and run. It was huge for me. And that kind of, I think it, I, at least hearing your story, kind of goes back to that uh, comp competitiveness because, like, you just figure, you're looking and being aware and, you know, you notice something. If you do that, you're going to be successful. And it's like, I got to do whatever I can to make it happen. Yeah. And I think that's lacking in today's game, especially at the youth level, um, even at the big league, <laughs> yeah. big league level. And there's a lot missing and that's kind of I feel like is what your whole movement is about right now and you know I just think it's really cool that's why I wanted to get you on video and talk some hitting and stuff like that if you guys want to check out more uh, Jeff's got he's on Facebook uh, he's got on YouTube as well so I'll leave his link down to YouTube you can uh, click on it go over there subscribe to his channel because he's posting some really good stuff some really funny stuff over there as well um, but you're gonna learn a lot so go check him out Jeff thank you so much um, thank you guys for watching. If you hop down in the comments section below, let us know what you guys are working on to, you know, get your swing right or, or work on your confidence or competitiveness, whatever it is. If you have the goals to achieve those high levels playing at the MLB level and being a great player, you know, let us know what you're doing to work on it because you can't do it by just watching a video and then sitting on the couch for another hour thinking about it. You got to get out there and put in the work, right? Yep. So thank you very much, Jeff. I appreciate it. Yeah. And I appreciate you having me. Sweet.